you or someone you love have scoliosis? Are you wondering what's next? What is life going to be like from now on? Or is this even a big deal? Hi, my name is Dave Butler, and welcome to the Scoliosis Experience. We are here to talk with real people, both patients, parents, and providers, to bring hope and clarity to the road ahead. Thanks for joining us, and let's get started. Welcome to today's episode of the podcast. In this podcast, I talked to Cindy Marty. I've known Cindy for about six years, and she was the one that actually trained me in the Schroff method. She is an instructor through the Barcelona Scoliosis Physical Therapy School, and she has a ton of experience treating uh, scoliosis and spine problems. So she was an amazing find for this podcast, and she sheds a lot of light on education and mindset behind the treatment of scoliosis. She talks a lot about the Schroth method and she talks about uh, advice that she would give people diagnosed with scoliosis as well as parents of those diagnosed with scoliosis. Cindy has a wealth of knowledge and being in her classes was amazing. I was able to spend many hours listening to her instruct on her uh, thoughts on scoliosis and the method that, that we're trained in and she's a great one to learn from. So this would be a great episode for anyone looking to get trained in the Schroth method, or uh, as she um, mentions, it's now more called the Rego method, and also anyone who is dealing with scoliosis themselves. And uh, I think we just hit the tip of the iceberg on her knowledge in this podcast. So here's Cindy. Welcome to today's uh, episode of the podcast. I'm here with Cindy Marty. She graciously agreed to uh, talk to me about her experience with scoliosis. A little bit of background on on how I know Cindy. Cindy's kind of my scoliosis guru. She's the one I go to when I when I have a lot of difficult questions. She was the one that trained me in the Schroff method, and we've known each other for about six years now. And uh, I've taken a couple of courses from her and it's it's been great so welcome Cindy and just introduce yourself a little bit thank you David it was a pleasure to have you in my class and have enjoyed our ongoing dialogue since then I appreciate your trust in me as a advisor outside of the classroom too um, so I'm a physical therapist I've been a physical therapist for do I admit over 35 <laughs> and um, I I'm a clinician first. I also have been a business owner. So David and I uh, have a connection on that level as well. And um, subspecialized in spine and then ultimately subspecializing in scoliosis. So, um, and I live in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin area and uh, happy to be here. How is Milwaukee this time of year? Beautiful. We're having a beautiful yeah. fall. It's oh, I a, bet. a very late, uh, leaf drop. So we've enjoyed oh, leaf yeah. weather at, at 70 degrees in October, which is unheard of up here. So it's been pretty nice. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about where your interest in scoliosis treatment came from. Sure. So I've been an orthopedic therapist my whole career and about midway through my career, I developed a keen interest in spine uh, primarily because I enjoyed the challenge of spine. It kept me fresh and engaged professionally, and I found I had a pretty good knack for it. was blessed to come across a couple of really good spine doctors and learned a lot from them and uh, kind of filled a need there when I opened my practice in 2003. And um, kind of filling a niche with spine. And then from there, sort of the next niche with scoliosis happened because a friend of mine, Beth Jansen, who is now also a fellow teacher and colleague of mine on the teaching side of things, exposed me to uh, the Schroth method through Dr. Manuel Rigo when she invited him to come to the United States in 2005 and give his first U.S. lecture. That was just a introductory Um, hey, United States of America, there's a way to address scoliosis that we've been doing in Europe for a long time. And if you guys are interested, you know, there's a way to learn more. So uh, that was kind of another one of those um, 
times where I, you know, thought, gosh, this is opportunity knocking. And here's another time where there's kind of an underserved population of people, as well as a knowledge gap, which is going to prove, I think, to be a really good professional challenge for me, but more than anything, um, help meet a need that's not being met. So it was um, just very exciting to, to listen to that lecture and decide where I could go with that. So that's kind of where, where it began and um, how the spark got started. So what year was that when Dr. Rigo came and did that talk? I think that it was uh, just a couple years into my practice. So I think it was 2005. As far as scoliosis goes, I mean, scoliosis has been around a lot longer than that. <laughs> so. Well, sure. And the Schroth method, you know, that, that uh, now is over, you know, well past its hundred year anniversary. Right. From company. And so it was certainly a long time coming that there was this grassroots effort uh, that I definitely tip my hat to Beth Jansen, my friend and fellow teacher, PT. Beth and I worked together as PTs uh, way, way back in one of our earlier jobs together. And so that's how we knew each other. And her son had scoliosis. And uh, that's how she met Dr. Rigo, because she took him to Spain to look for an alternative because she was unhappy with his care in the United States and the direction that it was going. So through her um, I guess, ingenuity, bravery, and research for her own uh, son um, led to the relationship with Dr. Rigo, which led to him coming to the United States uh, upon her invitation to see if we could generate enough interest to host the first course for physical therapists, hmm. which happened um, within that same year, around the same year, within the same uh, year, and uh, where he, we were able to gather seven of us therapists together from that first kind of audience. And he said, well, that's enough. Uh, I'll come back and I'll teach the course. So hmm. at the time I owned my clinic and my employee, Amy Spiele, um came with me to that lecture. And she and I were driving home from Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And we, we were both just giddy with excitement and enthusiasm. And we said, oh my gosh, like we have to do this. Like, how do we not know this information? How does this information exist in the world? And we're physical therapists. We work in a spine clinic. I own a spine clinic for me and I don't know anything about this. And I, you know, flash back to all of these patients that certainly had scoliosis, maybe as adults coming in to see me and I had no tools in my toolbox for it. So we were pretty giddy with excitement leaving that lecture. And we're really excited that we, and we took the certification class together, which was the one and only certification class that Dr. Rigo taught in the United States. Oh, wow. Um, and then, you know, the seeds got planted. That's kind of how it started. Wow. That's yeah. Very interesting. Thinking about you as a spine specialist, you'd probably seen a fair number of scoliosis patients before. So before you were introduced to this method, how, how is scoliosis usually treated? And sadly, how is it normally treated generally in physical therapy now? It's kind of a little bit of an off-topic question, but. No, um, well, I was an adult orthopedic specialist, uh, adult orthopedic therapist, I should say, not specialist because I wasn't an OCS uh, formal specialist, but I was an adult orthopedic therapist. And so I didn't see pediatrics. I didn't see adolescents with scoliosis because that's mm -hmm. kind of its own niche more with pediatric uh, specialty practices or in kind of an hospital environment area. But I uh, saw a lot of, well, basically all I saw for the, you know, previous several years before I opened my practice was spine. I just limited mm -hmm. practice to spine. So of course I would see patients come in with spinal deformity and I just tried not to do bad things, <laughs> you know, basically <laughs> right. it was more of a of a, well, that doesn't look good, you know, as you're <laughs> in exercise. So it was a uh, avoidance of bad things, trying to be protective, but nothing strategically to address the biomechanics of it in a three-dimensional way. Or uh, I had no knowledge base of how to educate them about what was happening in their spine. Mm -hmm. 
And I didn't see it often enough to maybe, maybe my bad in hindsight, I didn't see it often enough to uh, propel me into doing further research about, gosh, I need to learn more. I was just kind of treating within the context of my otherwise pretty deep and wide toolbox of spine things that I knew. And fast forward now is you still don't do bad things. And you right. still um, reach in your deep and wide toolbox for addressing pain and function based on the individual goals. But now um, we, we have this three-dimensional knowledge of understanding the condition. And it, again, in my world as an adult uh, spine therapist primarily, you kind of divide those adults into two or three camps because some adults are just grown up kids that (laughs) had scoliosis as adolescents. Some adults had no scoliosis as adolescents and they developed scoliosis due to that great thing called aging and the aging spine, which, you know, degenerative disc disease and other, other age related diseases of the spine and disorders of the spine Uh, create an asymmetrical wear and tear. So they have what we call adult onset. And then you have some adults that are a mixture. They had adolescent scoliosis and then degenerative changes are making their situation worse. So the first place it starts is understanding the diagnosis, which is what we always have to do as good clinicians is, wow, I understand why you have scoliosis, which scoliosis do you have? And now I can understand how not only to not do bad things, but how to treat you in a three-dimensional way, because I understand the biomechanics of your condition. Which, which is really huge. I mean, that, that allows us to, like you said, not just avoid bad things, but actually make some progress with those. Awesome. Right. So you kind of touched on what, what makes you an expert in the field of scoliosis, but kind of give us an idea of, of why you are someone that uh, people should listen to about scoliosis. Well, first I'll, I'll kind of first sort of answer that in a very humble way is I'm only one of many people that people should listen to. And I'm certainly not uh, the most knowledgeable person in the world, if there really even is one, but maybe I'll reflect back a little bit on my journey that I think gives me a little bit of street credibility, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, that after that first certification course, I decided to, Amy and I together kind of launched our program at our clinic from scratch, you know, scraping, scratching, having really nobody else in the country that was doing it yet. So we learned uh, ourselves on how to create that. And um, I, we decided to get involved in the, the, comp- the organization called SOSORT, which is the Society for Orthopedic Scoliosis Rehab and Treatment, which is the international society that's focused on conservative management of scoliosis in pediatrics and adults. And so I started to go to these international meetings uh, at great expense as a private practice person, but it was so eye-opening to hear and see and meet people from around the world and learn not only just about the Schroth method, which is what I was trained in, but other methodologies in the world. And these meetings were um, research-based meetings. So you got to listen to what's the latest and greatest in happening in conservative management um, from the research world. So I was on the education committee and I was on the board for a while and I presented at some meetings and I I just delved in so that I could um, gain a broader viewpoint of what was happening outside our little Milwaukee, Wisconsin (laughs) world. And um, so that involved us going, Amy and I going to Spain to shadow Dr. Rigo um, shortly after our training. And we spent a week with him and his therapy team to observe the methodology. uh, And even though we didn't speak Spanish, (laughs) it was a good learning experience to just watch and not know what was being said. That's a learning mechanism in and of itself. So then in 2011, I was invited by Dr. Rigo along with Amy and Beth and a few others around the world to kind of start um, the first teaching group for his school, the Barcelona Scoliosis Physical Therapy School, which he formally founded in 2008. 
And he recognized, uh, we all, he recognized that uh, he needed to cast his net wider, that he couldn't do it all. He couldn't be the only instructor. And um, so he invited us to become instructors and we came back to the U.S. And in 2010, 2000, well, 2011, after that, we started teaching. And the, as the saying goes, um, if you really want to be good at something, teach it. Uh, if you have to teach it, you really have to know it. And so that journey over the last decade of being a teacher in the method has made me uh, an a much better clinician than I ever would have been uh, had I not learned how to be a teacher. So I think there's a lot of that history, I think, that makes me somebody to listen to. Um, I was invited to do a MedBridge online course somewhere in that time frame, And MedBridge is a online continuing education company that does courses for physical therapists and other professionals. And so I did um, introductory courses on scoliosis. And I that was another opportunity to kind of cast the net wider to stimulate interest in the professionals to say, hey, we don't really know a lot about this in PT school because there's a lot to learn in PT school. And it's a knowledge gap. It's going to be a knowledge gap for you when you get into the world of orthopedics. And so know what you don't know and decide to either refer to somebody that knows or learn it yourself. Um, and then from there, we it kind of took off the last 10 years of teaching and we formed our group in the United States. And so Amy and Beth and I are part of a company we formed called the Schroth Barcelona Institute in the United States several years ago to kind of formalize our group of United States instructors and BSPTS has now grown. And I think that they have, I think we now have uh, instructors in um, 43 countries. There's over 30 instructors through the BSPTS now. Wow. And um, Dr. Rigo recently had, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but he's, he's very much formalized his school a little bit more in the last 15 years, 10 to 15 years since he started it in 2008. And again, to cast his net wider and to plant the seeds and the younger therapists to be teachers and to be treaters. And so I guess through that whole journey, I feel like I, I should be listened to because I have experience. I'm, I have a lot of exposure to other people in the world. I try to think outside my, my, myself a lot and kind of the the I see things through the lens of clinician business owner yes because there's a practicality to applying this method in our country there's mm -hmm. the quality of that certainly as a clinician teacher and um I think I'm a good communicator so um but I think probably more than anything listen to me because my experience is based upon the guidelines that came out of research. You know, we, I follow guidelines that are set by soul sort that uh, come out of research and come out of, out of international consensus. So the BSPTS is the school and the method I teach and um, practice, but we're part of a bigger thing called soul sort, which is many countries and many schools and many methods uh, that are, that set guidelines for us as clinicians, as clinicians, we need to look to research and we need to look to guidelines and blend that with our experience and blend that with the individual patient situation, kind of that evidence-based approach to medicine being research experience and patient centered. Um, so that's how I try to approach anybody that approaches me, whether it be a clinician or a patient or a parent um, about it. Well, and, and I think that's great. The, the reason I think people should listen to you is because I've listened to you. In, in, for, <laughs> well, that's for many, the best reason of all, Dave. <laughs> exactly. For, for many hours, uh, I've listened to Cindy and, and just your wealth of information on, on not just scoliosis, but spine. It, I mean, it's amazing to me. So that's, uh, yeah, a great, great summary of why someone should listen to you and, and the other instructors in the BSPTS. I mean, you guys... Uh, like you said, 
it's not something that's just uh, you know a, a theory that's thought up. It's something that's research-based, and I think that's what makes this significantly different than a lot of the other conservative treatments that we see, um, is that this has a lot of backing to it. Mm-hmm. Which is, which I agree is with that, and, and research always starts with an idea, and we don't develop new things without ideas, and so there's this um, process from idea to evidence. And we have to be open that there are different layers of evidence from one case all the way up to high level um, research uh, criteria based papers and and publications. Uh, So there's a wide range of research when we say that we're evidence based in our um, methodology uh, so that we don't lest we squelch new ideas. Uh, to say, oh gosh, there's not, you know, 500 papers about this. That's not really the point, but but it is evidence-based and there's a deep and rich history from a hundred years ago or more with the Schroth method. And now what we like to say in our school, there are many branches from the tree of the original trunk of Schroth. Um, and even from the, the, the trunk of Schroth, just other scoliosis methods. And so mm-hmm. Uh, whether it be research about our method in BSPTS or research about scoliosis exercise in general, looking to other schools like uh, one of the more published schools in the world being the um, the Isico Institute uh, that researches the CAS method, the scoliosis exercise, scientific exercise approach to scoliosis. Very, very well published. All of these schools have one thing in common, and that is that we believe that exercise done based upon the individual curve using biomechanical principles because you understand the condition of scoliosis, that the outside influence of exercise can influence the spine and can influence the person and can influence the quality of life. That's what they're all rooted in. Right. And and we, it's cool for me to see that each month I see more research coming out about this. I mean, it's something that's not, you know, there's not minimal research on this now. There's a lot of research on these methods and, uh, and we can definitely trust in, in a lot of that research. So it's great. Sometimes I will say, you know, my weakness is that I am not a researcher, right? I'm a good Mm -hmm. And I'm a good educator and, and, and these, and I'm a good, these other things. Um, but the, uh, there is a lot of growing body of evidence. And, and one thing that gets my feathers ruffled sometimes is when the idea about physical therapy for scoliosis, when this idea is shot down, um, by sometimes members of the medical community or the general community at large, it's shot down. And the reason being is, well, there's not enough research. And that really gets my feathers ruffled because um, the, uh, what, what do we mean by research? Again, it's this loaded question. There's plenty of research. Maybe it's not research that is at the level of research that you um, expect. And of course we would, we hope for, we hope for a growing level of research with this methodology but scoliosis is a complex condition with a lot of variations, which has to be that this ha- this fact has to be respected. And the ability to research this is is maybe, well, it's not maybe, it's quite a bit different than researching some other things in medicine that might be a bit more clean cut with a few less variables, and the treatment is a little bit less complex itself. So the condition, the variability, and the treatment. Are more simplified that research can can grow to a higher level faster and uh so lest we say there's no you know be careful i get again it's not that there's no research the level of research might be criticized and we everybody at soul sort would agree we all want higher levels of research about the methodology absolutely um but there are plenty of things done in medicine um with varying levels of research that maybe are criticized less harshly 
then sometimes the exercise-based approach to scoliosis is criticized by some members of the medical community and, and just the community at large because um, it, uh, you know, what, when, one thing I'll say is, is uh, yes, can you do harm with exercise if done incorrectly? Of course, you could do harm on your patient if you don't apply these exercise methods. You know that yourself as a clinician. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the exercise approach, relatively speaking, is is a um, it's not an irreversible <laughs> intervention. This is something that that is conservative in nature and by and large, with the right education, quite safe to try. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm I'm really glad that you get your feathers ruffled with that research question, because I get my feathers ruffled about that, too. And mm-hmm. I think one day, maybe that won't be as much of an issue when we talk to surgeons and other medical professionals. So, right. It's growing yeah. and it's improving. And in the last 15 years, um, you know, students that come to my courses, the great thing is that hospitals around the country are sending therapists to the courses because the surgeons themselves want the therapist mm. to be trained. They want the conservative option, either preoperatively or postoperatively or to, to avoid surgery or to just improve the quality of life. They want the, the multidisciplinary approach to the condition, which is what we're about. We're not just physical therapists treating in a bubble. We're part of a multidisciplinary team. We should be working within the team of the physician and the brace professional, uh, sometimes a psychologist and, uh, and the physical therapist. And so it's nice to see in my years of experience with this that um, the program development happening around the United States anyway is, um, is really opening up which is supported by more and more physicians over time. Awesome. Cool. Well, one of the questions I was going to ask uh, is what misconceptions you, you've you seen around scoliosis and scoliosis treatment. I think we've talked about some of those, I mean, around research and around uh, exercise approach to scoliosis, but any other misconceptions that you that you see? Oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I would say that they're lessening over as education spreads, which is good. Um, but I maybe will answer this more patient centered, like where, where I feel it coming from the patient. And, um, it starts with why did I get this condition? You know, what's the cause? And there's some misconceptions about they did something wrong. They caused this to themselves. Um, or there's um, a cause that can be, re- can be reversed. Uh, so it kind of starts with explaining that, that despite all of the research that's happened for, for decades and decades and decades, that we still call it idiopathic scoliosis. And that is because idiopathic is the fancy word for we don't quite know the cause. And there, the current thought is that it's a multifactorial condition contributed to by many things that includes biomechanics and biology and and so forth. But the cause is still not completely nailed down. There is no one cause. Uh, So that's one misconception is I, I, I did something wrong and I got this condition or especially from parents, I did something wrong as a parent. And now my daughter has this problem because I didn't tell her to sit up straight when she was younger. Right. Of a thing. Some misconceptions that adults and kids, uh, there's some similarities, but adults need to be treated differently, like we talked about earlier about the different causes with the adult. I think another misconception is that uh, there's nothing that can be done because yes. uh, oftentimes patients are told this. So they may have been told by a physician or, or another medical provider or somebody in the community, a family member. Oh yeah. Yeah. A lot of people have scoliosis, but there's nothing you can really do about it. You just, you know, just go about your life. And of course we don't agree with that. There's knowledge and exercise and other things. I think maybe also the kind of some of the misplaced goals about what we do, like 
are goal oriented in our approach. And when patients come in, sometimes we need to do a bit of background education. We want to listen to what their goals are, but the misconceptions that the important goal is that I have less severity. You know, the important goal is that my curve is less of an angle, what we call the scoliosis angle. Sometimes the, the, we need to, the, there's misconceptions about what's the goal of treatment with physical therapy. And the expectation might be, I want you to straighten my spine. Or the more goal is that I want, if I have a 30 degree angle, I want, I want you to, to make my angle smaller. The research supports that the severity of the curve is not the primary indicator of the quality of life. So we sometimes have to kind of direct the patients, you know, listen, empathize, uh, understand why they have that goal, but to help to uh, reduce that concept misconception that if your curve is smaller, you're going to have a better life. And that's not always the case. Sometimes it's the case, but that goes back to that individual, individualized, uh, you know, directed um, decision-making with your patient. Um, so it's really more about the quality of life, which might be less about how big the curve is and more about pain or more about, um, their body image or more about their ability to do their work or play their sport or things like this. So that's, that's where I would say some of the misconceptions lie from cause to goal oriented and, and kind of what is therapy all about in terms of exercise based approach. Yeah. And I think sometimes our, our patients and, and us as clinicians, sometimes we get so fixated on how big the curve is, you know, what the Cobb angle is that we lose, lose track and lose sight of what you're talking about. You know, what are the, what are their real goals? And, you know, the, the research is often based upon measuring the Cobb angle mm -hmm. and we can sometimes stabilize it or reduce it. That could be a reasonable goal case by case. And, and quality of life is a difficult thing to measure. You know, a Cobb angle is easy to measure. So we can measure that and use that as a, an outcome. But it, there's kind of this mismatch between, well, if a 30 degree curve doesn't necessarily cause more problems in adulthood than a 35 degree or a 40 degree curve, um, why are we measuring this? Not to say it's unimportant, it's very individualized, but quality of life is more important. This is the biopsychosocial model of care that the Cobb angle is easy to measure, right? It's an angle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, sometimes uh, we defer to that because, well, that's what we know. That's the way, main way that scoliosis is measured radiologically. Yet there's a kind of a, sometimes can be a little bit of a mismatch that the research doesn't support necessarily that a five or 10 or 15 degree difference in your Cobb angle may or may not influence your quality of life. Again, we have to be very individualized about this. I'm not saying Cobb angle is not important. Don't, don't misconstrue that. But in modern medicine now, we, we need to follow what we call the biopsychosocial approach. This is all medicine and bio meaning the biology. That's the Cobb angle that some of those biological aspects of, of the condition you're treating, but you have the psychosocial, which is the psychology, how do people feel, and the social, which is kind of how do they function in the world and in their communities and in their families. And I love Dr. Rigo's tagline, if you will, to the BSPTS, which is treating the person, not just the curve. And I think that that's how, uh, one of the misconceptions is let's try to think beyond the cob a little bit. We respect the cob. We have goals related to the cob, but we're treating you as a person. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's great advice for anyone with scoliosis. You know, the, the cob angle is just one piece of the puzzle. So um, one thing I wanted you to describe, we, I've done other, you know, podcast episodes on the Schroth method and uh, kind of what, what we do, but you as an instructor in the Schroth method, can you give us kind of a, a summary, a quick summary of what the Schroth method is? Um, sure. A quick summary, I would say, is that it's a, it's a three-dimensional exercise technique. 
That is a quick summary. (laughs) That's a quick summary. (laughs) However, it's not just an exercise technique. It it is also a um, educational model for the patient to stay their posture in life, not just during exercise, but the exercises are intended to how, how the rubber hits the road with function in life. Um, and, uh, but that, that would be it in a nutshell. It's a three-dimensional exercise approach. If you think about scoliosis being three-dimensional, it's the technique is designed to try to bring out what's in because there's concavities in the, in the spine and, uh, bring in what's out because there are prominences or, uh, in the spine and in the torso. So we try to do that in a three-dimensional way to create a better stability of the trunk and of the spine so patients can function better. Fantastic. I, I get that question a lot from, from patients. What is the trough method? So I like that right. you, you've summarized it like that. Um, and we already talked a little bit about what, what to expect and what our goals are with it. Um, but any other, any other descriptions on what people can expect result wise and, and what that would look like? Sure. I guess I would be remiss if I didn't backtrack a second. And, and like we talked about earlier about the trunk, the tree trunk being Schroth, you know, Katerina Schroth, we, we pay homage to Katerina and then Krista Leonard and then Hans Rudolf Weiss. These are the history of Schroth in Germany where it all was begun. It all began And just like anything in medicine and life, techniques and things evolve. That's a good thing. So our method right now, we've evolved enough over the last 10 to 15 years with Dr. Rigo that we went through kind of a big transition in in the last few years that we are are now calling what we're teaching the Rigo method. And that is because there's been a lot of really exciting evolution in how Dr. Rigo, based on his experience working with Krista Leonard Schroth, working with the Schroth method as a physiatrist, a physician, and an orthotist, a brace maker, and a therapist. He's kind of all three multidisciplinary members in one human being, which is quite, quite amazing. <laughs> right. Uh, he's evolved things. And so what I would refer to now is the Rigo method. Um, uh, based on the Schroth method is kind of what we're what we're saying to to describe our school in a more effective way. Um, it kind of goes back to the goals of what can patients expect. It's always going to be individualized, but um, if the curve is progressing because they're a growing child, um, we would hope to maybe slow or stop the progression of the curve if we can. Um, we see improved torso um, shape meaning uh, the aesthetic, uh, which like it or not is important to people in their sense of self-esteem and in their sense of more or less related to their torso shape, depending on the patient. And we, even though we may see absolutely no change in the x-ray, we can see dramatic change in the torso and in the aesthetics. uh, which can be extremely empowering and rewarding for the patient's uh, and their goals. Um, I would say if people have pain that might be related, uh, let's face it. I think upwards of 80% of adults at some point in time or another are going to have back pain in their lives. So we have to be, when we have a patient with scoliosis that comes in with pain, um, one of our first jobs as a therapist is to sort of kind of weed out you know, is the pain back pain that anybody could be walking in with without scoliosis or how much maybe uh, is the pain being contributed to in some way from the scoliosis and, or a mixture thereof. And so uh, pain could be a very, uh, very measurable and very meaningful outcome for this technique. And sometimes you need your adjunctive tools as a physical therapist with doing other manual therapy techniques or other things that we already do for back pain. But my experience is that when you have scoliosis and you use this three-dimensional approach, uh, pain is more effectively treated uh, in these patients. So, um, and I guess maybe the, uh, we see improvements in respiration um, is another 
individual. Some people have no problems with respiratory dysfunction with this condition. Other patients do. We can measure that uh, because the original method way back with Katerina Schroth was called orthopedic breathing. And that was uh, a nod to the fact that our respiratory muscles have a lot to do with what uh, what they are put through when you have scoliosis and what you can do with them uh, to improve things when you have scoliosis. So breathing right. could be a big goal and we all like to breathe. So that, that could be an outcome somebody might expect if they have that problem. Um, I guess the final two things might be, you know, this day from your experiences that we're asked about, you know, can I prevent surgery? Um, this can be a, a very challenging question of either a parent coming in with a child or an adult themselves. And um, any medical professional out there would say, if there's a way to prevent surgery for any medical condition, this would be called a good idea. And so this is no exception. Yet the same sentence is true when we say, thank goodness we have surgery for some conditions that need it when surgery is the best option and is going to be resulting in the best outcome. So uh, that, that holds true to any condition. And so this idea about can a patient expect to prevent surgery by coming in and seeing a scoliosis therapist is very individualized. And it may be, yes, if that's important to you as a patient, I will support your goal to try to prevent surgery and live with your scoliosis the best you can, if that's your goal. Uh, in some cases, um, surgery maybe is going to be your best option. And I, I don't have the crystal ball, depending on where you are with your growth or with your condition. If you're an adult that you have other problems like arthritis and so forth that we don't, we don't know, but I like the motto of let's try and see, let's try. And if surgery isn't imminent and is not uh, dangerous to postpone, then let's try and see if this goal is reasonable or not, but we are not anti-surgery, but if preventing or postponing surgery is realistic and important to the patient and done within the context of the multidisciplinary team, you know, with the support of the physician, um, this might be an expectation of the method that uh, is important to some patients um, for sure. Like it would be for anything, you know, if you can get through yeah. without needing your rotator cuff repaired, if you have a torn rotator cuff, then, Hey, do rehab. See if you can make it through without needing to repair it. It's the same idea. Right. Uh, but if you can't use that arm uh, right. by avoiding surgery, then maybe not or, the best option. Or playing baseball is very important to your mm -hmm. quality of life and you want to throw with that arm, you know? So maybe for some patients, it's based upon their functional goal that they don't feel that without surgery, their quality of life can be met. Yeah. So, um, and, I, and I guess, you know, for sure, the overriding thing that anybody coming in for therapy for scoliosis can expect honestly is, is um, a sense of empowerment that they have uh, knowledge to gain and they have information to make decisions with that they didn't have before. And um, to me, that's probably the single most rewarding part of working with this methodology is, is giving that sense of empowerment to people. Yeah. I would totally agree with control that. everything. We can't control everything about scoliosis. So we have to be careful, right? We're not yeah. all but yeah, but let's do a, something rather than feel powerless. I think that's great. Um, okay. I want a couple last questions. The question of, uh, you know, you've worked with so many scoliosis patients. Uh, what advice would you give with someone that has just been diagnosed with scoliosis? And on the other side of it, what advice would you give parents of, of a child who's diagnosed with scoliosis? Kind of the, those two, those two populations. So what advice would I give the child diagnosed with scoliosis? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, first, I think you have to try to see things through the eyes of the child. 
and um, listen, listen and listen about what's happening in the mind of that 13 year old or 12 year old um, with the knowledge that they've learned about this condition. And um, I would want to address maybe some of their fears or some of the misconceptions that they may have and just open myself for them to ask me questions. And I think the advice would be very much directed toward what are their questions? What are their fears? What are their understandings about where they're starting from the first day I meet them in my treatment room? Hmm. And um, not to just give advice that's general advice, but to make that advice directed toward where that child's head is at. Um, I'd like to know what's important to that child. And um, if playing soccer is a 10 over 10 in their quality of life as a 13 year old with their best friends, um, how can I give them assurance that you can absolutely play soccer with scoliosis? And, and that can dispel so much worry that until you dispel some of those things, it doesn't matter what advice I give, they will not hear me until I assure them that I am listening to them and I understand what they want and what's important to them. Um, and then I think once I get through that, um, my advice is really centered around supporting those things and letting them know how I, what my role is in that. So I'll, I'll say, you know, it's really kind of a bummer that you got diagnosed with this. And I would just say, if I were you, I would think it was a bummer, right? <laughs> and that's okay. And yeah. uh, kind of meet them where they are. And, and it's okay to feel that it's a bummer. And uh, my advice is that, well, sometimes things happen in life and this might be an opportunity for you to learn something about how, how you approach something that happens in your life that you wish didn't happen to you. And you might feel kind of young to have to go through that somewhat adult uh, uh, lesson, but, um, but you might find that there's something kind of good that you're gonna learn about yourself and about this, you know, we can't turn, you have scoliosis. So that's where we're starting. Yeah. So let's try to, let's try to um, feel how you can uh, learn how to live with this and not have it be, I want you to be mindful about having this condition, but feel that you've got uh, some, some good things that you can do about it and make you feel good about that you're trying hard to take care of your spine and in the same time do everything that you want to do as a 13 year old with your friends and with your sports and with school and um, we're going to take it day by day let's big advice is kind of a day by day month by month let's if 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 you start asking me questions about what about when I'm all grown up and I'm 30 years old I'm, I'm not trying to brush you off by not answering those questions, but I think our energy is better spent on talking about what we're going to do now, because we don't really know. Lots of things could happen by the time you're 30 that have nothing to do with your scoliosis. So let's do what we can now together. And I promise you that I will support you. I will listen to you and I will be a good teacher for you and uh, kind of coming from the PT, but I guess back to the original question about advice, which is ask questions that are on your mind, that are making you worried. Be sure you get those questions asked, answered, and you can you you speak your mind. Speak what's on your mind, young thing. <laughs> your mind, and uh, and then try hard to listen to the people that are trying to help you. And take it day by day um, and uh, that's where I would, that's probably what that's, I would. That's good advice. And I, I think it's so important what you mentioned that we align our goals with what the kids goals are or, or understand where they're starting from, because uh, I've had quite a few times where I have a, a kid in my office and their parent is going at a hundred and 
10 miles an hour and just, <laughs> you know, just what do we need to do? We need, and, and I've turned to the, the child and asked, do you ever wonder what the big deal is with scoliosis? And they'll usually kind of, kind of say that. Yeah. Kind of glance at their parent, like, and then look back and be like, no, I don't know why this is such a big deal. I'm like, why no am one... I here? Yeah. Well, I I'm feel like, fine. I'm I feel like, perfectly fine. Why am I in the treatment room? I'm like, no one has explained this to them. No one's educated them on this and no one's taken the time to actually ask what their goals are. And, and so I think that's important advice for therapists working for, well, any medical provider working with kids with scoliosis, but, um, you know, for kids speak up and ask those questions. I think that's, that's fantastic advice. So what, what about for parents, Cindy, what, what advice would you give parents? Um, listen to your child, (laughs) some similar things, um, a lot like similar advice I would give to the child about, you know, okay, mom, uh, maybe I need to say to parents, okay, tell me what's on your mind. Tell me what your fears are. Tell me what your goals are as parent for your child and kind of go through that same process with the parent. And because as you probably remember me saying in the course, sometimes you're treating the parent as much as you're treating the child in the days, because it's all very emotional and it's very scary for some parents. And they might come in with misplaced sense of, of guilt. Like we talked about, about the cause, or maybe they missed it. Why didn't I see this? And now Mm -hmm. the now my daughter needs to wear a brace and it's all my fault because I missed it. And the, these, so first, first and foremost, let them get those things off their chest and understand, uh, you know, maybe they have scoliosis and they know that there are some uh, familial um, tendencies toward some of the genetics behind scoliosis with family history. And they have a sense of, of blame uh, that they have scoliosis and how you uh, need to listen to that. But then in terms of uh, through that, it's the best way that I would advise the parent is, um, your role is to, you know, support your, your child and giving them, first of all, if we're doing physical therapy, get them to their appointments, let this be as, uh, important as, you know, soccer practice and sometimes therapy, you know, if it's the last thing you always schedule, it's going to be hard for your child to maybe get the momentum behind the technique that they need to learn, just like weekly piano lessons, you know, type of a thing and um, set up what they need at home. And uh, those maybe sound like kind of really simple pieces of advice, but uh, they're important because they're practical. And then to just support your child's learning like you would with school they're learning new things here and um, they might be challenged more with math than they are with, um, you know, reading in school. And so different kids are going to be challenged a different ways with this and you can help them with their math homework, but you can't be their math teacher. So you can help them with their scoliosis exercises with equipment and encouragement and asking them, did you do your homework for your back? Um, Like you would for math. But uh, I don't expect you as the parent to understand this method or to treat your child just like you wouldn't be their math teacher. So let me do my my um, my job as the teacher and you support your child through the process. And and then also kind of not let the parents wheels get spinning too far into the future. You know, nobody wants to see their child to have to wear a brace. But if a brace is indicated, physical therapy and bracing go together. We are not replacing bracing. So a big role is, hey, you're coming to therapy. I, I can support you and how you're, how you're managing wearing your brace. And we can talk about your brace and work with your brace and encourage you. And I think that parent role in, in, in uh, being, being supportive is, is, is the best thing and not thinking too far down the road about maybe they don't need a brace now. And the parent is, oh my gosh, what if they need a brace? It's like, they might need a brace. And if, and if she does need a brace, if your daughter needs a brace, it's going to be okay. I will help them and we'll get through it. Oh my gosh, what if she needs surgery? 
you, maybe your daughter will need surgery one day. And if she does, I will help you and we'll get through it and just keep, let's focus on what we can do now and whatever presents itself next year and next year, there's support for you. Yeah. Great advice. I love it. Okay, Sandy. So final question. If someone wants to connect with you or learn more about what you do or, uh, you know, PT wants to get trained in, in the Rego method or, you know, anything like that, where can they go to, to contact you or find more out about you? Sure. Well, the Rego for the Rego method specifically for, and the, the BSPTS.net website. So that's BSPTS.net website is the school's website that talks about the method. And it also talks about uh, what's called the Rego concept, which is basically addressing all of the three members of the team. So it's a multidisciplinary school that addresses the orthotist, the physician, and the therapist. So all of those members of the team can go to the website. Um, and then for the physical therapist, that website will tell you where the, uh, more about Dr. Rigo's philosophies and hear him um, speak a little bit and direct you to where all the courses are around the world. And in the United States, um, our group, Amy, Beth, and I, and Patty, who's also a member of our group that's um, not actively teaching now, but was a very important member of the initial teaching group. We have a website called um, Shroth Barcelona Institute. So they can go to the, what we refer to as SBI. So they can go to the Shroth Barcelona Institute website and all of our courses are posted there and we're getting a new website in January. So that'll be kind of exciting. Um, and we're trying to have information on there also that's directed somewhat, not just to the therapist, for, but for parents, again, to address some of these misconceptions that might be out there for, for, for the parents. Um, and for me personally, you can just email me directly. I'm always happy to, to outreach. My email is on that website, but it's um, cmarty at sdwpt.com. Uh, so you can reach me there. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing this podcast episode with me. I think uh, it brought up some great, great points for anyone dealing with scoliosis in any way. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Cindy. Well, thanks for having me, Dave. And I applaud you for taking this from coming to a class many years ago to starting your own practice. And as I like to say, kind of cast the, cast the net wider so you can impact more people's lives. And certainly this podcast, if it brings one patient uh, to anybody's doorstep to help them, it's worth it. So thanks for doing it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm.